Um, this podcast is brought to you by the Almamac and Scientific Canada. It was recorded on the traditional territories shared between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. Enjoy. I feel like I just butchered that again, even though we That's close enough. <laughs> we just had the conversation. Okay. My research on <laughs> uh, light adaptation in the in the fish right now. I'm sitting in a kiddie pool, actually. It's, uh, <laughs> it's quite nice. <laughs> oh, that would be great. But it's oh, uh, not very professional. Hi everyone and welcome back to the Almamac. I am your host Adam and today we have the second part of my interview with Severa, the inventor and original host of the Almamac. Last week I talked to Severa about why she started the radio show and what direction we're going to take it from here. You can listen to it over on our website scientificcanada.ca. You could also go to almamac.ca. But today I'm bringing you the second half. So we're finally going to dig into the research that Severa does. And spoiler alert, she's currently working through a dual PhD MD program, but I'll let her explain that in the interview. So let's not waste any more time and let's dive in. So you're in neuroscience, we know this. Fans of the show know this. Sure. What do we not know? Start from the beginning. You Uh, started at Western and you were, what were you doing at Western? Neuroscience. I was doing neuroscience at Western. Yeah, it was a relatively new program that they had just opened up. So I was the second cohort to graduate from that program. And I really enjoyed it, not just because of the subject, but also because of the small class sizes. So in second year, um, once I entered that program, for that course that was only specific to our neuroscience grad students, we had probably like 30 students in that class. And those were the same 30 students that we continued with onto third and fourth year. So it kind of built a sense of community. It was nice, mm-hmm. as opposed to some of those undergrad classes that we know are hundreds of people. Yeah. Um, so I really enjoyed that. And talking about, I guess, um, what I wanted to do in the future, I knew, I realized, I still, do you know what flashbulb memory, memories are? Have you heard of flashbulb memories? Flash, flash, bulb. flash bulb flash. memories. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm trying to interpret it based on the, the words that are, but you, well, you tell me and I'll see if my guess was correct. <laughs> okay. So from my understanding, flashbulb memories are memories where you can pinpoint exactly where you were, what you were doing, um, because oh, that day okay. is, was so relevant or important to you. Yeah. Close, okay. close to your guess? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so I, I call it like a flashbulb memory. At least that's what I wrote in my statement of interest and when okay. I was applying for grad schools. But I remember sitting um, in my second year organic chemistry class. I'd come there a few minutes early and I was just rifling through the practice exams that they provided for us. It was the beginning of the course. And I'm just rifling through the practice exams. Um, and I'm just kind of looking at the, uh, the past practice exam for the, for the final exam. And I'm going through some of the questions and I remember, I didn't know it at the time, but I was looking at um, an NMR graph, nuclear magnetic resonance. Ugh. Does that sound familiar, Adam? Is that yep. good? Okay. Yep. <laughs> I remember looking at that and the question was, so they had the picture of the graph and the question was, what molecule is this? And I remember thinking like, we're going to be able to learn this? Like, are you, I'm going to be able to answer this question in like three months, that's incredible. Hey everybody, just a quick thing. Uh, editing this, we realized that uh, we didn't really go back and talk about NMR at all. So here's a little picture of an NMR graph. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see that. If you're listening, you can't. But the gist is all of these little peaks here, they tell you something about the molecules that are in your sample, uh, specifically the, I think, protons and how they sort of operate. And so you can look at these peaks and um, you know, have a good idea of what kind of molecules are in your sample. Yeah, I I was just amazed, Adam, at the fact that I would possess the knowledge to answer this question. Um, So at that moment, I realized, yep, I want to learn forever. And that was kind of where I decided that one of my goals in my life was to get a PhD. Anyways, fast forward a couple of years, once I um, successfully battled senioritis and I graduated and I, I was kind of deciding um, the classic question that every 
um, science undergrad has when they graduate, right? What do I do with my BSc? So like I said, I knew that I wanted to be a lifelong learner. I wanted to be surrounded in an environment where I was always learning. And don't get me wrong, getting a PhD is not the only way to do that. But for me, I felt like that was the right path. I was toying with some other career options too. So I had applied to medical school out of fourth year as well, and I didn't get in. Um, so I was dealing with that as well. So I realized, okay, either, and I knew I wanted to reapply to medical school because I'm the type of person where I got to give it my best shot. Um, and then I can, you know, kind of live a life with no regret. So I knew I wanted to reapply, but I was toying, okay, do I take a year off um, and volunteer or get a job if that is even possible, if that was possible for me. Um, and then I thought about it and I said, well, I know my goal is to get a PhD. So why not work towards that goal? And I um, thankfully had applied for um, graduate programs as well when I was in my fourth year. And I got into McMaster's neuroscience graduate program, which I was really excited about. And in terms of my specific field, so in fourth year, I took this fascinating course on reproductive endocrinology. And I realized I really, um, so kind of like the hormones um, during the reproductive cycle for bo both males and females, but this one had more of a female focus. And I realized I am really interested in maternal health. And I was interested in, um, I was involved in some mental health initiatives as well throughout my undergrad. So I kind of decided to marry those two, two interests. And um, my master's supervisor was working in the field of maternal mental health. So I thought this is perfect. Like, not only am I gonna learn about something that I love, I'm gonna be working towards my goal um, by completing a master's. And also, to be honest, testing the waters to seeing what graduate education is really like. And um, I started my master's and I really enjoyed uh, living in Hamilton, being at Mac, doing my research. And I was encouraged to apply to the MD PhD program, which is a combination of medical school and graduate school. And I got in and I'm currently a third year MD PhD student still in the neuroscience program. Um, I just finished the first year of medical school. I was gonna say a couple months ago, but no, gosh, the <gasps> time is not really anything nowadays, is it? Um, back in June, I believe of 2020. Um, okay. I know we're already saying 2020, right? Back in 2020. But, yeah, I'm trying uh, to count on my fingers. How long ago is that? <laughs> is that two months? No, six? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> closer, yeah, closer. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and then I've, I've been back um, doing my PhD work. Interesting. And, yeah. So let me, let I me was, ask. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Go. I was going to say that was probably much more than you expected, but... Gosh, you just pulled that story out of me. And I guess it had to be told, especially the flash bulb memory. It had to be told. It definitely did. I asked how you got here and I wanted you to start from the beginning. And so that's what we got as, as yeah. requested. Uh, so I have a question for you about this MD PhD program. Um, sure. So f first part of the, the question is more of a comment. Cool idea. Uh, you hear about people getting, you know, MDs and PhDs and you think like, Holy moly, you must have been in, holy moly again, number two. Uh, <laughs> you must have been in school forever to get that done. But this is this is a way to kind of get both in a more efficient way. Is that correct? Will yeah, it take I think fewer it might... years? Yeah, so if you were to compare to doing an MD degree, which um, I can only speak in. Um, so MD, MD PhD degrees are worldwide, I think most commonly in Canada and the United States, far more common in the States, but I can only really um, speak for Canadian experience, but Canadian medical schools are four years. Some schools are two years, um, McMaster, two years. Whoa, could you imagine? Some schools are three years, I should say, uh, McMaster being one of them. Um, and then PhD um, is that PhD portion of the MD PhD is four years. So for a total of seven years, so in terms of saving time, if you were to do the two separately, I would say, if anything, you may be saving one year um, because at the four-year medical schools, from my understanding, uh, they have three years to complete their PhD, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so at the end of the day, whether you're going to a three-year or four-year school uh, with regards to your medical education, it's typically a seven-year program um, to get both your MD and PhD degree. Um, in terms of in terms of why you should pursue an MD-PhD degree, I know that's a question you didn't ask, but just to put a quick disclaimer, if you're doing it for efficiency, um, 
I don't know if that might be the best reason to go pursue a dual degree program that can be quite tedious and arduous at times, mm -hmm. but objectively, yes, it may save you one year. Okay. And um, yeah, so the, the follow-up was exactly that. What I think I'm, not, I'm probably not the only person, since I, I never really considered a med school path, um, I don't know why somebody would get both. I always kind of thought maybe like you thought you were going to go in one direction and then decided that you wanted to do the other one, so you ended up with both. Um, but the fact that these are melded from the get-go suggests that there is a reason why you would want both. What is that reason? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I think a lot of people might have heard of the statement from, you know, translating research from bench to bedside, right? Um, and I think what really excites me, well, since I'm doing clinical work, is um, as a future doctor, if you are able to see some, you're going to be seeing so many patients. And if you're able to identify perhaps some common issues or problems that your patients may be experiencing with whatever it may be, um, whether it's the healthcare system or with regards to their own personal health, how cool would it be to take what you're seeing clinically from your clinical experience and formulate that into a research question, answer that research question for the benefit of your patients? I just, I just find that fascinating. Um, and I think that's why some people uh, pursue this dual degree option is because they have this passion and this curiosity for um, answering questions, whether that indirectly or directly benefits patient care. Yeah, and it's something I want to learn a lot more about as well, like this idea of the reproducibility crisis. I think they tried to reproduce, I think it might have been only been psychology studies, and there was a really low le reproducibility rate um, mm -hmm. when they did that. So yeah, it's it's I think these issues are really important to talk about as grad students and future researchers, right? Because you want to make sure that you do the work justice and you're not just kind of throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm very interested in that. I wouldn't want to be the person that has to solve these problems. It seems very complicated <laughs> and yeah. uh, hard to, I don't know, I'd be too invested in, in certain aspects of things. Um, but it sounds like you found a, a path that would let you feel good about, you know, the type of research that you're able to do, um, get the inspiration from the places that you want to get it, and then actually solve problems and questions that, that you know are going to be, you know, effective and worth doing. You yeah. don't have to gamble and say like, ah, oh, I hope this ends up being useful to somebody. You, Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's the hope. And again, you bring, you're bringing up a really important point, um, which is when designing research questions, um, designing them in collaboration with the people that it's going to affect, right? So whether that's patients or if you're working with a community, make sure you're engaged with that community um, and you're designing something that's going to help them rather than mm -hmm. designing questions that you're just really interested in. So, uh... So you're getting back to the research part, the PhD part of the of the combined degree. Yes. Um, how's that How's that working with uh, with these lockdowns and stuff? Is that uh, <laughs> has that been slowed down a bit? Yeah, I think, like you mentioned at the beginning, I think who hasn't been affected right by this um, pandemic and the second lockdown. Um, so it's certainly affected me, but uh, thankfully my supervisor has encouraged me to be productive, um, as he says idle hands are the devil's work. He has a lot of pocket phrases that I need to write them down so I can memorize them. But um, that's a very yeah. grandparenty type thing to <laughs> Oh, is it? Um, Thanks yeah. So, so um, yeah, he's encouraged me to remain productive. Um, and I think a lot of other junior researchers may have had to pivot their work as well, whether that's um, kind of turning to to data sets to um, write papers or whether they're working on reviews themselves. Um, and that those are actually both uh, items that I've been working on um, mm -hmm. as I'm still waiting for my um, main project to hopefully get underway. But yeah, I think it's just important that you're flexible with the types of research questions that you pursue. Yeah, hopefully your supervisor, while you know encouraging productivity is, is a little bit flexible with what productivity looks like you know what i mean yeah like, not necessarily 
what is what looks like productivity in the before time might not look like productivity now and vice versa. Yeah, I just as an aside, I love that the before time and the after time. And that's that's the only way I actually refer to things now. Yeah, um, it, it, it really feels like there was a, a turning point, a cusp in our, our timeline, if you will. Yeah. I've been yeah. reading a lot of sci-fi, so I'm feeling like uh, <laughs> post-apocalyptic in a sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. But um, yeah, on, on your point of productivity, yeah, I've definitely been um, reading a lot of stories, mostly on Twitter, on how people have felt that their productivity has really been affected, right? Naturally, I mean, we're dealing with completely um, abnormal circumstances. Um, Sometimes some days are easier, some days are not. But I think as long as you're generous with yourself and you have um, a good support system, which includes both like supportive mentors and supportive lab members, um, mm -hmm. it makes things a little bit easier. Yeah, I got to say the the work from home aspect, pros and cons for sure. But uh, I think one of the big pros, and we kind of were talking about this in the pre-interview a little bit. I think it makes it easier to work a non-traditional set of hours like a, a nine to five was very convenient if everybody had to be in the same building all at the same time um you know being able to speak to people in like face to face whenever you need to it's useful if you're gonna all be together but if you're working asynchronously then uh you know I think it's encouraged people who aren't necessarily good at doing a, a full eight hour stretch beginning to end. It's uh, liberated them from the, those constraints, if you will. I take two hour naps in the afternoon sometimes. Sorry to keep cutting in here, but uh, I just had to point out that I did that before as well. I just did it underneath my desk. Sorry, Kari. You need those. You gotta you do what you gotta them. do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, so I don't know if we even said this on, on camera or on tape or whatever you want to call it, but uh, you're back. You're back with the Alma Mac. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yes. So um, I'm here. I'm back. Um, I think in the beginning, I don't know if I, if I even mentioned this, but um, yeah, I did hand off the show to you, Matt and Sean, and I think you've been continuing it with it for the past several months. Um, which I'm certain the listeners are extremely grateful for. And you've done really, and I wish you can also speak a little bit about how much um, you've expanded the show and the different things you've done with it. Cause uh, I've been keeping track, but yeah, I handed it off um, for a year and a few months um, as I was going to medical school, just because I was kind of thinking like, well, I'm not sure if I'll be able to balance both things. And also um I wanted to kind of see uh, where the show could go and it went incredible places and it's going incredible places. But now that I'm back in my PhD, I've just been itching to um, get, get interviewing again at the interview bugs. So uh, I'm excited to come back. Yeah. So you've got some, uh, some interviews lined up. We're not going to spoil anything too soon, but uh, we'll be hearing a lot more from you. Yeah. Very excited. Um, yeah. I can touch on a few of the, the things that I've, I've, done in the last little bit as a little recap um i'm starting a media empire that's kind of the <laughs> this sounds uh, better than the originator and proprietor that you were calling me before uh yeah i think maybe i'm, I'm hyping it up a little bit too much um basically what that means is i made a website uh <laughs> i made a website that i'm also posting all mac episodes onto outside of cfmu um it's also distributing it to Apple, I, whatever you call it, Apple Podcasts and Spotify and things like this. Just making it easier to to access the show. It doesn't have to just be a radio show. Um, so that's been a part of it. Um, I'm personally trying to get more into like science writing and science journalism type stuff. So I've been trying to interview as many people as possible from all over the place. So I've expanded out of the McMaster Dome uh unfortunately sometimes on thursdays if you're if you're really hankering for a mcmaster grad student you might not get one every time uh it it's been i've been occasionally getting people from the states and, and various other oh. places i think next week um you might hear from a researcher in england who Ooh. talks to crows and cats wow it was kind of cool um but yeah i'm just international oh yeah 
we've crossed the pond. <laughs> it's a re- oh man, I found this person via Twitter. Uh, she was looking for volunteers, uh, volunteers to follow their cat around all day and record the meows and send it to her because she wants to test to see if uh, humans can differentiate the meows from different cats. Interesting. Yeah. And you did you do this? Because I know uh, you have this calico cat. Well, I, I asked her if she needed some more recording. And she's like, you know what? Twitter and social media and cats. Okay, it, yeah. They, those it's a keywords. Home run. Okay, got it, got it, yeah. <laughs> she's like, I have way more than I could ever use. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's a, a pretty interesting linguistic thing that she's, she's working on. She also worked with crows um, doing the opposite. Can crows differentiate human speech, which is cool oh. too. So that, that's, that's a really interesting one. Um, but yeah, I've been you know, writing stuff, posting blog posts and doing interviews with people all over the world and just trying to keep a, a weekly schedule, at least something getting posted every week. Um, but now that both of us are here, uh, maybe we can do two a week. Who knows? Whoa, let's not get ahead of ourselves, Adam. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> yeah, let's not, let's not uh, promise anything we can't deliver. Um, yeah, I've had some guest writers on the website. Um, I don't know if you knew about that, but uh, there's a couple of interesting articles from people who went to uh, science communication conferences and um, science policy conferences was the, the most recent one which is, is pretty interesting. I, I attended it as a virtual conference, um, kind of as a, on a lark. I was like, well, it's not too expensive. It's like 30 bucks for a student. Um, mm. I don't know much about Canadian science policy. I don't know who does it and what they talk about. So check it out. And very interesting, very, very cool stuff. Nice. Uh, so yeah, there's an article up on, a, on scientificcanada.ca about that. Um, there's a special tab for Alma Mac stuff. Uh, we, there's a special tab for out of country stuff and yeah, You've that's, been busy. The, that's the gist. Um, haven't expanded to CBC or taken over any sort of, <laughs> uh, national radio stations yet, but, uh, we're working on it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think with you and me, I think we can, we can. We could displace quirks and quirks, I think. <laughs> oh my gosh. Could you imagine? Yeah. Oh, That'd man. be a pretty cool job. I, I'd be yeah. down for that. Hey, he's got to retire sometime. The, the host has to retire. That's right. Maybe not right now, but. Uh... Yeah. So we're yeah, not, we're that's. Not, we're, yeah, we're totally not coming for him. <laughs> we can work together. It's fine. Yeah. We're, <laughs> we're all researchers here. So yeah, that's uh, that's what's coming down the the pipeline. I'm uh, I'm very excited. This is gonna be this is gonna be great. Yeah, yeah, and thanks um, thanks for today's show. Thanks for all the past episodes that you've taken care of. Uh, I am very excited to come back and be a fellow co-host and get to know um, graduate students a little bit more, especially. Um, with the current circumstances, the trying times. I have to say mm-hmm. it all, Adam. I have to use all the buzzwords. <laughs> I love um, trying times. That's my favorite times, one. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I like that one. Um, <laughs> There's a whole host of grad students you've never met. That's right. There's whole co- cohorts of grad students who have started that. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. I got to get on them. Got to get on them. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's like, like you and I, like we both love learning. So it's like when you're interviewing people, it's like, gosh, I never did that before. And then I think it gets you excited. It gets them excited. So I'm just looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, any, any sort of human interaction, I think will do anybody good. Whew. Yeah. This has been a, a really nice thing to have in my life <laughs> with, uh, with quarantine and everything, getting to, to actually see people's faces and talk to people is uh you, you don't get that as much as you're used to these days. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody's listening and they want to come in and chat, hey, come on. <laughs> plenty of time, plenty of space. Let's do this. You can't say that you got plans. Come nope. on now. <laughs> you can't say that. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And I'm so excited to see what you have in store for us. This is going to be great. Thanks so much, Adam. <laughs> okay. Let's sign off. Take care, everyone. See you next week. All right. Well, thanks again to Severa. And 
Look for some new interviews with her and some guests coming up in the future. But before we go, I just wanted to let you know that we have a new article up on the site. It's about this really interesting result from statistics that says not all digits come up with the same frequency in nature. It's called Benford's Law, and what it says is that in these large naturally occurring data sets, the leading digit of the numbers don't look as random as you might expect. In fact, it's been shown that 1 comes up almost twice as often as 2, which comes up about twice as often as 3, and so on and so on and so on. And it seems like this relationship holds for a heck of a lot of very different things. Uh, from populations to, of cities, to the heights of buildings, uh, surface area of rivers. These are all things that people have, you know, tested with Benford's Law, and it, it looks like all these results fit with that relationship. Um, it's actually so robust that uh, sometimes forensic mathematicians use it to try to find data that's been tampered with, and this could be in, you know, research data. It's also in financial data sometimes, and in the latter case, it's actually been used in court. So the result sounds really weird. It actually kind of sounds like some mystic numerology business, but Benford's Law is something you can prove mathematically. The full proof is not super exciting, if I'm being honest, but the reason it works has to do with how natural systems relate to the logarithmic scale. This is the scale that slide rulers use, and it lets you represent numbers over several orders of magnitude on the same line. So that means instead of spacing numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4 evenly on a ruler, the logarithmic ruler would space things like 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100, 1000, etc. Space those evenly. So it seems like a weird thing to do, sure, but if you think about trying to plot, say, the population of cities in Canada on the same scale, the logarithmic scale starts to sound a little bit more reasonable. And what Benford's Law says is that if you have a collection of data that works more naturally on these logarithmic scales, um, as long as the numbers don't depend on each other and are somewhat random, then if you look at the data, and specifically the leading digit, you'll find 1 more often than 2, more often than 3, more often than 4, etc. And in sort of a, a roundabout way, it's, it's because if these are randomly distributed numbers, and they're randomly distributed on a log scale, if you look at the log scale and you look at the gaps between, say, the number 1 and 2, either in 0.1 or 0.2, or 1 million and 2 million, the 1 and 2 gap is a lot bigger than the 2 and 3 gap, which is a lot bigger than the 3 and 4 gap, and so on. And it's actually this that gives you that very shocking result. So it is a surprising result, and it works on a whole bunch of data, but it doesn't work on all data. And one data set that it doesn't work on is the US presidential election data. Now, there are many, 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 many papers and blog posts and articles and you know, podcasts and whatever that explains why election data shouldn't follow Benford's Law, but that hasn't stopped people from trying to apply it to election results, specifically the most recent US election. In the article, which is up on scientificcanada.ca, I don't talk about why Benford's Law doesn't work on election data though I do link to a bunch of articles that do a really good job of explaining why. Instead, I talk about why I think math, stats, and Benford's Law specifically are so attractive to be used to push political agendas and, and trick people. So if that sounds interesting to you, you can hop over to our website, scientificcanada.ca, and I guess we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot.